Professor Sir Peter Horby, who is the Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases and Director of the Pandemic Science Centre at the University of Oxford. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Charlotte, and uh, thanks very much to the organisers for inviting me. It's my first trip to Dublin, and it's a wonderful city, and the sun's coming out. Um, so I'll see it in a different light this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, clinical trials because, you know, I guess you know, that's why I've been asked to come here is because of the recovery trial. Uh, some background around the recovery trial and what I think the lessons are for clinical trials, both for epidemic infections but for other diseases as well going forward. Um, so I've called it medical science in a crisis, both because it's around doing medical science during health emergencies, which has been the work I've been working on, but also other areas of clinical trials um, where I think we have problems and we need to resolve them. So I'll take you back a bit in time to a call for global action as outbreak spreads. Taking a bit further back than you might imagine, this is going back to the 2009 influenza pandemic um, where we got the usual uh, wonderful headlines from the, the British red top papers um, as swine flu came upon us. Now remember this is a a pandemic that we were expecting. We knew we would get a flu pandemic at some point, so we should have been pretty well prepared. And how did we do in terms of our clinical trials? Well, pretty poorly. One of my PhD students went through all the literature and looked at the number of trials that were registered and the number of patients that were anticipated to be enrolled. And that's the first bar you can see there, just over 4,500 patients were anticipated to be enrolled. And then she looked at the number of patients that were actually enrolled during the pandemic. And remember, this was, you know, it lasted quite a long time. And just, you know, over 500 patients enrolled. And then if you look at the number where they were actually published, it was tiny. And were any of those published um, and created any change in the treatment of flu? No. There was absolutely no improvements in the treatment of flu after our pandemic. <clears throat> this was one that we knew was coming. And, you know, 20 years later, the treatment of patients hospitalized with flu has not improved as a result of that. So, you know, 20 years of lost ground. Um, so I called that the epidemic curve of ambition because I'm a sort of infectious diseases person. So I think of everything that way. Um, a huge number of ideas, but not many effective protocols, hardly any patients enrolled and no actionable evidence. And in 2009, we set up you know, a number of initiatives to try and improve this, to change the, the standard of clinical research in epidemic infections. We wanted to shift that curve so that um, epidemic research was done much better because that's the only time you can enroll patients is during your epidemic. You have to do it then or you can't do it. So you have to improve what you're doing. So bringing you forward in time to the next pandemic where the the red top papers has not, have not improved at all. They may even have got worse. Um, question is, has our clinical research capabilities improved? So this was our early experiences. After 2009, we set up a, an organization called ISERIC, which Kenny's already talked about, and Kenny was one of the uh, early members. One of those partners was in China. And so very early on, just on 2nd of January, our ISERIC partner in China called us up and asked for assistance from the global community. Um, and we did. We, we got on the phone with clinicians in Wuhan, with clinicians in Saudi Arabia who were treating MERS patients. We used a lapinavir ritonavir protocol that was written for MERS, and we implemented it very quickly. In fact, we got the first patient enrolled in just 20 days in Wuhan. And that, that's, a, um, that's an achievement of peer-to-peer um, -peer relationships between clinicians across the world. It wasn't anything special. It was just that there was a trusted relationship and we knew we had to work quickly, and so we worked together very quickly. I would say here, on, on the 31st of January, I gave, I gave a talk. I came, I, I came to the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and gave a talk and showed this slide on 31st of January and said, um, you know, enrolling a patient in 20 days uh, into a trial that started 20 days earlier was something we could never beat and that I should retire. Um, I'm glad I didn't. Um, partly because that's what happened. Uh, after that lecture um, was that the epidemic was controlled in Wuhan, the case numbers plummeted, thankfully for those in Wuhan, but it, 
<coughs> it wasn't good for our trials. So lupinavir ritonavir on the left was the, the very first randomized control trial in COVID-19. <coughs> About 200 patients, too small to give us any reliable evidence. The second is um, the first placebo controlled trial, which was done in Wuhan as well. Um, again, 200 patients, just not big enough, so didn't give us an answer. So we got started quickly, but still the epidemiology beat us. And the crisis spread. On the basis of the early enrollment in those trials, we managed to um, submit an application for a grant to make that into a COVID-19 platform trial in China. <clears throat> but it, as you saw, was controlled in China, but it started to affect the rest of the world, uh, particularly Italy. It was obviously um, the red flag for us here in Europe. And this is the, the timelines in the United Kingdom. Um, I put up there on the bottom left, we had an ISARIC, uh, one of our consortium's members assembly in Annecy um, on the 25th, 27th of February. And I think that was probably the first ever COVID scientific meeting. Um, we'll have gone to more than we ever wished to by the end of our careers. Um, but I remember at that meeting, Kenny said to me, oh, would you consider doing a trial in the UK? Um, and I sat next to him and said, oh, no, I don't think that's up for, I'm not up for that. Um, and little did I know that he'd just reviewed the grant that I'd submitted and they'd said that they would fund it, but not in China. They'd only fund it in the UK. And that's the money that was used for the recovery trial. Um, I think rather than go through this in detail, I think that the point I want to make is there on the, the 10th of March, we had a, a meeting with the chief medical officer uh, who showed great leadership and said just, we said what we wanted to do, platform trial in the UK across the NHS, and he just said, just do it. It was a 10 minute meeting, he said, you'll get my full support, that's what we want, just you have a green light. And just um, nine days later, we enrolled the first patient, so that's about 10 days from the first draft of the protocol to enrolling the first patient. Um, so we did beat the 20 days, and I think I might retire now, because nine days is definitely something we're never gonna beat. Um, and interestingly, this has been Cal on the left, enrolling the first patient in the very first trial in Wuhan. Um, two months later, we were enrolling the very first patient on the John Radcliffe in Oxford. So we were able to move, because of this peer-to-peer -peer physician network, rapidly, you know, information from MERS in the Middle East, trial in Wuhan, and then straight to move it to, to the UK. And the principle behind it really was it's got to be simple. And uh, Martin Landre um, is a cardiologist, he's co-chief investigator, and he got out the ISIS-2 protocol, which was, you know, what many of you are old enough will remember these very fundamental early trials in, um, in myocardial infarction prevention. And on the front page of the protocol, it says this, uh, by far the most important determinant of success is the extent to which in those busy hospitals where the majority of acute MI patients are actually admitted, the responsible physicians and nurses choose to enter their patients. So the extra work must be and is absolutely minimal. It worked then, it's been forgotten, and it's worked again in COVID-19. It's a fundamental principle that if you want to enroll enough patients to answer questions definitively, and be able to look at subgroups of patients, you need to make it simple so that patients at the coal face where the clinicians are busy can be enrolled. And uh, we made it as, as include, made it as simple as we possibly could and we made it as inclusive as we possibly could. Uh, and so we started it very quickly and you can see this is the recruitment graph and it, it maps the, the outbreak in the UK. And at the peak of the first wave, we were enrolling on some days more than 400 patients a day. And again, we thought that was a record we never wished to beat. But in January um, of the large wave in 2021, um, at one stage we were enrolling more than 500 patients a day. And we enrolled more than 1,000 patients in one 30-hour period. So a phenomenal rate of recruitment that would only have been possible with a very simple trial. And you can see it was um, recruiting across the entire UK. We've now got you know, over 47,000 patients enrolled. So it's an incredible testament really to the NHS, the NIHR, and the clinicians who are uh, willing to uh, take the extra effort and the research nurses the extra effort um, to get patients into trials. And just to show you how inclusive it is, um, this shows you the age distribution of cases. And you can see uh, up there in, in the box, um, 
the minimum age was zero, so we have some infants, and the oldest patient is 103. Um, so I think we might have broken a record there with the, the, the widest age range. It, it's open to pregnant women and it's open to children. So we really try as hard as possible to make this completely inclusive. You know, COVID affects everyone, including pregnant women who can get severely ill. They should all be um, able to access effective medicines, so they should all be in a trial. And I would say we're currently fighting uh, um, insurance companies about this issue of pregnant women in trials, and it's very frustrating. Uh, and it is quick, it is simple. I mean, many of you may have enrolled patients, but um, this shows you the, the, the IT system collects. So as soon as you say you want to start uh, entering some information on a patient to enroll, to the time at which the drug the patient is allocated appears on the screen, uh, the mean time is eight minutes. You know, so this is super simple. It's eight minutes from saying, okay, I'm gonna open the, 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 the page, the recovery page, and then up comes what you randomize the patient to. And so that's what, what you get with, with, a, with an efficient trial at the, at the, at the clinic, clinical cold face. You get you know, one trial with, with 10 clear, clear answers. Uh, these are the drugs we've put in so far. The numbers are the numbers on active treatment, so you can double all of those because there's that equal number, at least that equal number on controls. We've had 10 results, <coughs> uh, six clear negatives, and they've been dropped from, from routine care, and four clear positives, uh, all of them are, are currently recommended and we've got other drugs there and I would point out we've got influenza now in the trial it's on hold because there's not much influenza but these kind of platform trials can be multifunctional they can be used for you know any any respiratory syndrome so we're moving into flu and we hope to move into other infections and keep this going as a long-term national platform trial um, that just shows you the results and I think the point here is <coughs> You know, those of you who know these, but those who don't, you know, if it's in the middle on the one, it means it doesn't do anything. On the left, the treatment works. On the right, the treatment doesn't work. And you can see the very, you know, small confidence intervals are very clear answers. You know, it's clear that colchicine, aspirin, convalescent plasma, lapinavir, ritonavir, azithromycin, they don't work. Let's, let's get rid of them. Let's move on. Um, but also, um, the trial's big enough to see subgroups, and Kenny's already shown you the subgroup effect by dexamethasone, so it works in some patients, it doesn't work in others. Um, the other good example at the bottom is Ronoprev, the monoclonal antibody, <coughs> which really works very well if you are seronegative uh, and have a virus that is susceptible to that drug, um, but doesn't work if you're seropositive. So the big trials also help you select your patient group. And it's been actionable, you know, so those results have all, all gone into um, treatments. Uh, this is the WHO treatment guidance of, of, of September 21. And recovery has informed um, nearly all of those, uh, not ivermectin or uh, remdesivir, but the recovery results are, are responsible for um, both some of the positives and negatives in WHO global guidance. So if I take you back to how we did in 2009, have we managed to solve... Um, uh, research in this kind of health crisis, uh, I like to think we've, we've done a much better job. So when we submitted the protocol, we said we would enroll 20,000 patients. Uh, we've enrolled 47,000. Because of the factorial nature where a patient can have more than one drug, they can be on an antiviral and an immunomodulator, they can count for you know, more than one comparison. We've actually got over 80,000 comparisons published and it's all been actionable. Every result we've published has resulted in either treatments not being used or treatments being used. So I think we have managed to shift that curve substantially. But it's not the only problem we have. Um, there's also the, so there's the problem of doing medical research in a health crisis, but I think there's an equity crisis in medical research. This is the global distribution of clinical trials pre-COVID. Um, and you hardly need to point out that you know, the big gap is low-income countries. It's now 30 years since we had the 90-10 publication where only 10% of biomedical research funding goes into 90% of the health problems. 30 years later, you've still got a graph, you know, a map like that. Pre-COVID, randomized trials are high-income uh, um, activities. And this is the distribution of COVID clinical trials um, by high, uh, upper middle, uh, lower middle and low income countries. And, and so these are the countries that were doing uh, randomized trials and enrolling patients. 23 high income countries, eight upper middle, three 
lower middle, zero low income. Th this is a massive inequity that, that still 30 years later, you know, RCTs are not being done in low income settings. Uh, and those patients deserve these drugs as much as anybody. And there's another crisis. I think it's the efficiency crisis. This is the cost of doing randomized controlled trials. Median cost of, of a trial, $19 million. That's all randomized controlled trials in, this, in, this paper, in these papers that I've got here. If you had an active control arm, the cost goes up. It's nearly $50 million. And then if you have a clinical outcome as opposed to a surrogate outcome, you actually have a clinical outcome like you know, death or disability, uh, it's up to nearly $65 million for one trial. Um, and the mean cost per patient, 36000 over $36,000. And taking nearly three years to complete. I mean, this is just you know, absurd amounts of money uh, and time. Um, and, and that's really holding back improvements in care. And so that's the general. And if you go, then go to the specific with COVID, this is an FDA review of COVID RCTs, um, looking at how many of them were adequately designed to give you an answer. And so if you just look here, uh, there were 2,000 trials, but with uh, nearly 3,000 individual treatment comparisons. And the FDA looked at whether they were well powered, powered enough to give you a reliable answer. Only 5% were adequately designed and adequately powered. So that's 95% of all COVID RCTs were designed to fail, you know, and many of them at vast cost. So this is a, a huge waste of money. We've got to improve the efficiency of, 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 of clinical trials massively. And so moving forward, um, we need to address the epidemic, the efficiency and the equity challenges of randomized controlled trials. Um, and we also have to meet our international commitments. We've made all these commitments, uh, the UK government with the G7 and the G20 around, we're gonna have vaccines, drugs, and therapeutics in 100 days. Um, we can't do that unless we address all of these things. So you know, the messages are, you know, randomized controls don't have to be complicated, they have to be practical. We saw that with the ISIS trials, we've now seen that with the COVID trials. Simple eligibility, clinically relevant outcomes, uh, randomization, by clinicians who are able to do that within their everyday practice. And this shows you, um, this is um, hospitals along the, the, the bottom axis here, and this is number of patients admitted, um, and the dots are the proportion of those patients admitted that were recruited to recovery. And so you can see overall 10% of all, at the time we did this graph, 10% of all admitted patients were enrolled into recovery in the UK. Um, but some hospitals were doing a phenomenal job. You look over here, this is um, admitting a large number of patients and enrolling about sort of 30% of all the patients into the trial. It's an absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, and it's these hospitals and, and these um, research nurses and staff and pharmacists that have made the difference, that have really changed the global practice for COVID-19. Why can't we do that for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, um, for sepsis, you know? Why not? That's what we should be aiming for. Um, the inequity issue, we've now gone um, international with recovery, um, and you can see uh, the countries there that are enrolling patients. And it's, it's been really good because it's the first time that many of the regulators have, in low-income countries have been introduced to platform trials. And it's taken them a bit of, a bit of time to get, get their heads around it. But now we're on sort of the third iteration of the protocol for them and the third change in the drugs. Um, they're starting to understand the value of the platform trials. And these are um, two colleagues who work for, you know, and live in Indonesia um, saying that this new way of doing trials has really been picked up by the FDA there um, and they need to widen their vision. So you know, this kind of very simple platform trial is ideally suited for low-income settings, actually. Um, and so it's, a, it's an opportunity also to reduce that inequity in, in the clinical trials landscape. And so just to f sort of finish off, um, where we were, where we have come to with, with recovery, um, and that we should be aiming to sustain this and not go backwards. Um, time to start a trial since funding agreed. Um, there is a report, okay, this is cancer trials, but this is the best I can find, with 621 days from funding agreed to first patient. Um, you know, we got it down to a few days. Now, obviously that was an extreme circumstance, but there's gotta be a middle ground between those two that's much better. Time to complete, around three years to complete a phase three trial. Uh, we had our first result in three months. 
Um, you know, it's 12 times faster just by having scale and simplicity. Those 2,000 FDA trials with, with no answers, you can have one trial with at least 10 answers if you design it well. And the cost per patient, not, not 36,000, but the cost per patient for recovery is $500 per patient. So a huge efficiency in doing trials this way. Um, the the contract research organizations will hate this, but that's an even better reason that we should, that we should do it. Um, so I think we, should, we have to sort of reimagine re randomized trials. You know, smart, smart trials, simple trials, um, delivered um, through the routine healthcare systems using electronic data linkage as much as we can, um, and proportionate trial regulation and guidance. You know, GCP is an absolute nightmare in many ways. We've got a 200-page MHRA report. Um, I think we should all get behind the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative, which is trying to get much more sort of pragmatic clinical trials regulation. Um, and all of that um, will be benefits for patients and, and public health and the public purse and, and, and many things that we all want. I'll just finish you know, with a, a last slide about there's a lot's been said about the, the legacy of the recovery trial. Um, but this is my favorite, which is a photograph from an ICU ward. I don't know who sent it in. Charlotte, do you know who that was from? Yes, it's from the Royal London. And is it from the Royal London? Where, you know, routine care, date of admission, what's the diagnosis, what's the microbiology, what trial are you in? You know, this, this, is, how to, this is how to do clinical research. If you, if you don't know, randomize the patients uh, on the ward, um, and most patients, you know, obviously they have to consent, but it's offered to every patient, and they're coming to the trial. You'll get answers far, far quicker, um, and we'll, we'll all benefit from that. Um, so just say th thank you very much for your attention, um, and obviously thank you to everyone who made it possible, most, most importantly the patients, but also you know, the healthcare workers and, and the research teams across the country. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we've probably got time for one or two questions. We start at the back. Thank you. Richard Wilson, Oncology, Glasgow. Thank you for a fantastic talk and for you and your team's wonderful work. One question I have is your cost of $500 per patient. Do you think that's true? If you think of, of all the research staff who came, who came to work and didn't work on things, so is it the financial cost, which may be underestimated, and it's also the opportunity costs as well? So just like your, your thoughts on that. But thank you again for the fantastic work. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's hard to get the, you know, the, those, those kind of costs. That 500 does include the NIHR costs and the estimates of, of, of that stuff, um, you know, with some compensation to the trust, et cetera. But it's obviously, it's obviously an underestimate. Uh, but also probably the 36,000 is an underestimate as well. Um, I think the main message is that, you know, there's a 70-fold difference between those two numbers. Uh, it may not be 70-fold, but it's going to be at least 20, 30-fold difference in reality. And then down the front, we've got Stuart and then James. Thank you. Thanks for an excellent le lecture. And it's a brilliant trial. I think just reflecting on, on what you've said, though, I think one of the key things is the buy-in of the NHS. Because as a trialist who wasn't doing a COVID trial, it was a nightmare. <laughs> you know, everything else stopped. Yeah. And, and, but I suppose, you know, you could say maybe the way to do this is, okay, next year we're going to do stroke. Next year we're going to do heart attack and, like, really pile all the resources at it. Because I think, I think that was a, a big success of recovery as well as, of course, a very simple protocol. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, that, you know, I think, you know, we will get... Um you know, we've got flu in, but that's going to take years because we haven't got the case numbers, we haven't got the, the clinical outcome rates that we need, so that will take years. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the same kind of effort, the sort of moonshot for stroke or dementia or whatever, you know, would be fabulous, wouldn't it? And, you know, having a platform trial where you could do 10 stroke drugs or, you know, 10 dementia drugs and just plow them through the whole NHS. And obviously, for recovery, recruitment was being done by everybody, not just the specialists, and we can't expect that. You know, we can't expect the non-stroke specialists to enroll stroke patients. So, obviously, we've shown what what the what the maximum you can achieve is, but it just shows you that, that there is huge capability in the, in the NHS to do much more. Seamus. These were fantastic. 
and to work for you and your team. Um, the nine days, before you retire, uh, the nine days, is that for first uh, protocol sign-off to first patient recruited, where was that for ethical regulatory approval in that process? It, it was in, within the nine days, so I, I, I have got a slide, but I, I didn't show it, but um, we, so it was about, so nine days was from the green light from Chris Whitty to the first patient. It, that was about 10 or 11 days from the very first draft of the protocol. But it was so simple, it was, you know, it was a few pages to begin with. And we got the regulatory and ethics approval all within the, the CMO sign-off in the first patient, so nine days. W what we did do, though, is we started with, with the simple stuff. We started with the repurposed drugs. We thought, you know, we've got to get it going. We've got to get the machine running, because if, if, if the engine's not running by the time the the wave hits, you know, we're not going to do it. So we went straight in with the simple stuff. So we went straight in with, um, you know, starting with dexamethasone and, and then um, hydroxychloroquine, things that, were, you know, we knew, we knew, we understood the drugs. They were on the shelf. Um, we knew that um, there was some justification for doing them. And so I think you've got to, um, you've got to get going with a very you know, simple protocol often and then you can build complexity. In the end, you know, we had multiple factorial comparisons. Um, <clears throat> quite complex stats, but you know, you just gotta get things started started very simply. Um, and don't, there was a great um, analogy that Martin Landre used, you know, he said people have a tendency when they've got a Christmas tree is to over decorate it. Um, and in the end, it looks really ugly and it falls over. Uh, and I think many people do that with trials. They say, oh, why should, well, perhaps we should measure the serum rhubarb, perhaps we should measure, you know, the, whatever. And all this stuff is very secondary and it's kind of a safety net for actually not having a big enough trial to look at a clinical outcome. Um, and so you've got to really be quite brutal about not over-decorating the trial. I think Jennifer's got a question, then Colin, and then I thought I might wrap up with one too. Oh, thanks, Peter. So you mentioned, um, and it's pretty clear, that there's a global equity issue with the trials. Um, but you also mentioned that you had funding to do the trial in the UK and not in China. So how do you propose, you know, obviously there's no quick fix, but how would you propose to make that more equitable? Yeah, I mean, the funding, I think it would have been funded in China if there'd still been cases. Right. I think the decision was, you know, yeah, we need a platform trial, but there's no point doing it in China because there's no cases there, so you've got to move it to the UK, which we did. Um, so we, we have got funding to do Recovery International, um, to, so to do that internationally, and we're currently talking with... Um, FCDO and, and other funders to to establish um, you know, a platform trial, not just in respiratory infections, but in other syndromes as well internationally. And it does need um, a change in mindset of funders to invest in long-term trials, not just say, well, yeah, well, what's your single hypothesis? We want an answer in two years uh, or three years. They've got to say, we're going to invest for 10 or 15 years in a platform trial. Could you see this being built into some kind of pandemic preparedness, that there would be an international agreement to start these trials globally? Yeah, I think that we're, we're talking uh, and we're thinking about that. The real challenge is what's the governance structure? You've got a, a, um, um, a conflict between you know, prioritizing drugs and not just everybody having a free-for-all, 2,000 trials and no answer. Um, um, uh, and how, how do you get that prioritization you know, done correctly? Um, but you also need the buy-in of, of, of the hospitals and the health systems and stuff, and so there is that tension. And I think you need a middle ground, actually, where you have special interest clinical research networks, like a you know, severe acute respiratory infections clinical research network, where it's peer-to-peer -peer, um, networks working together internationally. But you have some sort of external sort of prioritization process so that they that they put in the drugs that make most sense so i think it, w it will be challenging but I, th I certainly think it's doable i think we showed with the early trials in china that you know if you if you have these these sort of peer-to-peer -peer networks people are very willing to work with each other and it's actually much easier if you do it under the political radar if you try and do um you know multinational trials through um governments it's yeah it's imp it's impossible you have to really do it um from sort of scientist to scientist, physician to physician. Thanks. So I might ask quickly my question now because it kind of follows on from Jen. About a million people a year die across the globe of pneumonia uh, and a lot of them are under five um, and it's in every single age group it's in the top five killers of people. What is it going to take to make that better, Peter? What do we need to do? Because it's not just trials, is it? 
No, it's not just trials. I think, that, you, know, uh, you know, I've stuck to trials, but, you know, Kenny was showing um, observational data. I think um, we've got a lot, a lot of technologies now available to us. You know, we've, we've got the, the designs that we can enroll a lot of patients. The ESSERIC clinical database has 800,000 patients in it. You know, if you could take a fraction of that and sample them all, you know, for biology and for, for transcriptomics, et cetera, you could get a much better idea of actually what's killing these kids and then you could enroll them into trials um, of, of interventions. Although, you know, probably you need to think as well about supported care trials, which are more challenging. And I was, I was pleased that, that, the, that the, the supported care trials have got off, up and running in the UK of different oxygenation therapies around COVID, because I think that's part of the problem as well, in, in particularly in low-income settings. It's, it's the supported care standards and the thresholds for putting people on that that are, pro are part of the problem. Brilliant. And then I think Colin had a question at the back. Colin Dine, Cardiff. So, absolutely fantastic. But I just wonder if we can put a shout out for health data systems as part of pandemic preparedness. You had your outcome provided by the NHS because they can count deaths, which is, which is good. But we've got to be able to count a lot more things a lot more reliably. And I think the law had to change to some degree to actually do some of the linkages, if I'm right. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um all the stuff I've seen, you know, is, is, that, is that most patients are, are, are quite willing, you know, to consider being in trials and, and are quite willing for their data to be used for, for, for public health purposes, the vast majority of people. Um, and, you know, it's been a huge value to us to use data linkage with NHS Digital and others to, to, um, to do two things, really. One is to count things that we didn't want to waste the time of, of doctors and nurses counting. It's already counted, so why count it again? And the second was to validate. So we did cross-validation of things like whether people were ventilated. We could do cross-validation with ICNARC and with, with HES data and with the CRF. And you know, we could um, get a better estimate of the numbers. Um, and so I think that, you know, that, that, that's been hugely successful. And now we're having discussions with other countries. It is admittedly high-income countries like the US and Canada about how they can use health data, data linkage. But I think there's an opportunity for leapfrogging so, you know, a lot of um, low-income countries or lower-income countries <clears throat> can get over that stage of these horribly, you know, awful uh, hospital uh, electronic data systems and go straight to sort of tablet-based systems um, of collecting data. And there are some examples of that. There's a great, there's a um, Southeast Asia intensive care network that are using uh, mobile apps to, to collect um, um, intensive care data. And it feeds back to the conditions, their case mix, their outcomes, and then also it's centralized into, into like an ICU registry type data. So I think there are real opportunities of value in that kind of uh, electronic health records for low income countries too. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks once again, Peter, really great. Thank you.